Hello, today we're going to talk about evaluating limits analytically. My name is Tuesday J. Johnson. I am a lecturer at University of Texas El Paso and an assistant professor at Doña Ana Community College. This section is for Math 1411 at UTEP. It's Calculus, Limits and Their Properties, Chapter 1 of Larson's Calculus, 11th edition, Section 1.3, Evaluating Limits Analytically. So let's start with some properties of limits. Let B and C be real numbers, and let N be a positive integer. First, the limit as X approaches C of B equals B, because B has nothing to do with X. B doesn't care what X is doing. X could go to C, X can go to the store, it doesn't matter. B is just going to hang out and be B, because the limit of a constant is just the constant itself. Now think about what this limit is saying. As X gets closer and closer to C, what happens to X? It gets closer to C. So the limit of X is C. As X goes to C, X goes to C. And the same is true with the power. So as X approaches C, X to the N becomes C to the N. Properties of limits two, let B and C be real numbers. Let N be a positive integer. And f and g are functions such that the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals l, and the limit as x approaches c of g of x equals k. So both of these functions have a limit at c. Scalar multiple property says, if you're multiplying a scalar constant, so a number, right, b is just a real number, b times a function, the limit can just move the b out in front, the constant out in front, and it's b times the limit L, the limit of as x approaches c of f of x. The sum, excuse me, let me rephrase, the limit of a sum is the sum of the limits. Similarly, the limit of a difference is the difference of the limits. So the limit almost distributes through the sum and difference. Similarly with the product. The limit of a product is the product of the limits. The limit of a quotient is the quotient of the limits as long as the limit as x approaches c of g of x is not zero. So our k value can't be zero. And if we have a function raised to a power, the limit as x approaches c of f of x raised to the n power is l to the n, whatever the limit is to the n power. So these work nicely. They're like we would want them to work if we had to define them. <clears throat> if P is any polynomial function and C is a real number, then the limit as X approaches C of that polynomial is just the polynomial evaluated at C. So the limit of a polynomial can be found by evaluating the polynomial every single time. If R is a rational function given by P of X over Q of X, and C is a real number such that Q of C is not zero, so we can't have a denominator of zero, then the limit as x approaches c of the rational expression is just the rational evaluated at c. So the limit of a rational function can be found by evaluating as long as you don't have a zero in your denominator. So we can evaluate a polynomial to find the limit, evaluate a rational function to find the limit as long as our denominator is okay. If n is a positive integer, the following limit is valid for all C if N is odd, and as long as C is positive, uh, it works for even indices as well. The limit as X approaches C of the nth root of X is just the nth root of C. So again, just evaluate as long as the evaluation makes sense. As long as C is in the domain of the function, it's all good. If uh, F and G are functions such that the limit as X approaches C of G of X equals L, and the limit as x approaches c of f of x equals f of l, then the composition works out. The limit can move into the composition in order to evaluate. Trigonometric functions. Uh, we evaluate sine, cosine, tangent, cotangent, secant, cosecant, as long as c is in the domain to find the limit we just evaluate. But that's a lot, and it seems overwhelming, and if you need to, go back and pause and write them down and think about what that actually means. Maybe write yourself an example. But don't get overwhelmed, because really, 
the important thing is, as long as c is in the domain of the function, you can evaluate the function to find the limit. So that's always my first try. Evaluate the function. Do I get a number? Fantastic, I just found the limit. But if c is not in the domain, we have to have some strategies in order to find the limit. So that's what we're going to focus on, those strategies. And theorem 1.7 is a theorem, it doesn't have a fancy name, but it's so important. Let c be a real number, and let f of x equal g of x for all x except for c in an open interval containing c. So they might have a different output at the c value, but near there, they're the same. If the limit of g of x as x approaches c exists, then the limit of f of s, then the limit of f of x also exists, and they're equal. So this is essentially that the limit of a similar function is the same. Now remember, we don't care what happens at C. So a lot of times what we're going to do is get rid of, in uh, special mathematical ways, the problem spot and find an easier function that we can actually evaluate. Here we go. Our strategy for finding limits. First, learn to recognize which limits can be evaluated by direct substitution. If the limit of f of x as x approaches c cannot be evaluated by direct substitution, try to find a function g that agrees with f for all x other than x equals c. We're going to use factoring and canceling. We're going to rationalize. We're going to do whatever we need to do to find that new function g. Once we have that new function g, we use the theorem 1.7. And we could always use a graph or a table in order to reinforce our conclusion. So first, the limit as x approaches 1 of negative x squared plus 1. This is a polynomial. In order to find the limit of a polynomial, I evaluate the polynomial at c. That's it. Literally, do not overthink it. The limit as x approaches 4 of the cube root of x plus 4, I'm going to evaluate. Put the 4 in. 4 plus 4 is 8. The cube root of 8 is 2. I can evaluate it. Any radical with an odd index, let it be easy. The limit as x approaches negative 3 of 2 over x plus 2. I'm going to try to evaluate it every single time. So I put negative 3 in for x. 2 over negative 3 plus 2, that's 2 over negative 1. I get a fine answer of negative 2. Since negative 3, my c value, is in the domain of the rational function, I can just evaluate to find the limit. Tangent. Uh, x equals pi is in the domain of tangent. So in order to find the limit as x approaches pi of tangent of x, I evaluate. Tangent of pi is zero. Let it be easy when it is. Cosine of x happens to be a continuous function. A continuous function that has domain all real numbers. So as x approaches 5 pi over 3 of cosine of x, that becomes cosine of 5 pi over 3, which I know to be 1 half. So let's get into problems that we can't just evaluate. If I were to put a negative 1 in for x in problem number 6, I would end up with a 0 denominator. And 0 denominators are always a problem. So in this case, since negative 1 is not in the domain, I'm going to factor this numerator. 2x squared minus x minus 3. Factors is 2x minus 3 times x plus 1. Denominator is x plus 1. And notice we can factor the x plus 1s. My new function, that is the g function, and my similar function is g of x equals 2x minus 3. So for those of you that are using WebAssign homework, g of x equals 2x minus 3 is the similar function that I can use to evaluate. So once I factor and cancel, and I get my similar function g, now I can just evaluate because I've reduced it to a polynomial. Except at negative 1, there's a little different going on, but it's essentially the graph of 2x minus 3 near x equals negative 1. So I evaluate and I get negative 5. <clears throat> the limit as x approaches 2 of x cubed minus 8 over x minus 2. Again, I'll get a 0 in the denominator. So I factor using the difference of cubes formula, and I cancel my x minus 2s. Again, 
I'll have my g of x right here. This is my g of x function that results when I factor and cancel. And once I have my similar function, limit as x approaches 2 of a polynomial that I've reduced it to, I evaluate to find the limit. But just because we're doing all this work, don't forget, x approaches 1, 1's in the domain. All right, don't get wrapped up in your technique and always think that you have to factor and cancel. Sometimes you just evaluate and you're finished, like in example 8. In example 9, <clears throat> if I try to uh, uh, evaluate, as x approaches 3, I'll get a 3 in the denominator, or excuse me, a 0 in the denominator. But if I put a 3 in the numerator, 3 plus 1 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. 2 minus 2 is 0. So this actually looks like 0 over 0. Anytime we get 0 over 0 as a result of evaluating a limit, it tells us we have to do something. It tells us, in fact, that something can be done. I have no idea how to factor this, so let's do the opposite. Let's rationalize the numerator. Weird process, but it turns out that it works out really well in this case. To rationalize the numerator, we're going to multiply both numerator and denominator by the conjugate. The conjugate changes the sign in the middle of a binomial. And when I multiply right now, I have the difference of squares formula. So the square root of x plus 1 times the square root of x plus 1 is x plus 1. The square root of x plus 1 times 2 gives me 2 of them, but negative 2 times the square root of x plus 1 gives me negative 2 of them, so they cancel out. Negative 2 times positive 2 is negative 4. And in the denominator, I write them in factored form. I'm not going to waste my time multiplying these out, and you'll see why. <clears throat> in the next step, x plus 1 minus 4 is x minus 3. Hey, look at that. This x minus 3 is exactly what we needed to cancel the x minus 3 from the denominator. And I have a new function, a similar function, a g of x function, that is 1 from my numerator. When we factor, it might be handy to write the 1 times x minus 3 so that you see the 1 as it carries over to your numerator and you remember that you have a fraction. 1 over the square root of x plus 1 plus 2 is my new function g. So now, to evaluate the limit as x approaches 3 on something we would get 0 over 0 on, I can instead evaluate the limit as x approaches 3 of my new similar function, 1 over the square root of x plus 1, all plus 2. Evaluate, simplify, there you go. Always try to evaluate the limit of the given function. If you get a number, great, move on. If you get 0 over 0, there is always something that can be done in order to find a function g in order to use theorem 1.7. Alright, so the squeeze or sandwich theorem. I like to call it the sandwich theorem, but it's a squeeze theorem also. If we have three functions, h, which is less than or equal to f, which is less than or equal to g, uh, and they're in this order for all x in an open interval containing c, except for possibly at C itself. We don't know what's going on here, but H is down below, F is in the middle, G is up above. If both the limit as X approaches C of H of X equals L and the limit as X approaches C of G of X equals L, then it has to be that they squeeze F together and that limit is also L. Now the squeeze theorem helps us to identify two special limits. Those special limits are trig limits, and they come directly from an application of this theorem. If you want to know more, uh, you can look up the proof in Larson's 11th edition of Calculus, or if you're on the UTEP campus, come see me and we'll talk about it in person. Write these down, though. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x is 1. You're going to see this a lot in the homework. The limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine of x over x equals 0. Write these down, know these, memorize them, put them on note cards. You have a break between classes, look them over. How might we use these limits? If I have the limit as x approaches 0 of 3 times 1 minus cosine of x over x, I could use the constant multiple rule, bring the 3 out in front, and find the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 minus cosine x over x. One of our special limits, we know this limit is 0. 
So we have 3 times 0, which is 0. In example 2, knowing some trig is going to help you out here. We know that tangent is sine over cosine. So in our numerator, cosine of theta times tangent of theta we will have cancellation of the cosines and that's how we end up with our sine in the numerator. I didn't do anything with the denominator so my theta is still there. Now as theta approaches zero I get a zero in the denominator so I had to do something. I used a basic quotient identity cosine of theta times tangent of theta is cosine of theta times sine theta over cosine theta. This is the same as the limit as theta approaches zero of sine theta over theta special limit, I know that answer is 1. Oh, it would be great if I remembered what this is. I believe this is phi. The limit as phi approaches pi of phi secant phi. Rewrite secant is 1 over cosine of phi. The limit as phi approaches pi of phi over cosine phi. Cosine? Let's see. When I put in pi, it's all good. This is pi over cosine of pi, which is pi over negative 1, which simplifies to negative pi. Limits analytically, this one's a little long, but it really boils down to, if you can, just evaluate it. If you can't, get your algebra techniques out.